I know the program says that I'll review the recommendations of the task force with you, but we're, um, unfortunately, I'll be spending my weekend writing the task force final report. I'm about halfway through it. So um, what I'm prepared to do today is to um, walk you through some of the work that we've done over the past two semesters. We wrapped up our work in June and give you some tentative conclusions from the work that we did. It was a, a great group of about 20 people uh, to work with. It was one of the first task force that I've been on that the conversations were actually fun and creative. But I do have to warn you, if you get a call from the provost in the first month of school, he's probably going to ask you to serve on a task force and if, or if you're really lucky, to chair one. So I will be letting my calls go to voicemail um, this September. Um, our starting point for this task force was really um, a very interesting um, interview with the head of the Brookings Institute um, in which he talked about how scholars at Brookings, um, when they are brought on board, when they begin a new research initiative, before they do anything, there is a strategic communication plan um, uh, markets for or, or targets for very targeted communications, targets for targeted communication. I need to take an English class. Um, there, there's a very intentional process before the research ever begins on what are you going to do with the results that you anticipate finding? Who are you, what policy makers are you going to try to influence? And it was a really eye-opening um, description of what think tanks do and how they very intentionally set a research agenda to influence policy makers or other decision makers. And so our charge is really to think through how we could, at a reasonable cost, of course, um, come up with some suggestions for, um, some very practical suggestions for AU faculty to in, uh, in, increase the impact of their research in things, in, in strategies that were, um, sort of developmentally appropriate for where our institution is today, yet inclusive enough to cover social sciences, um, physical sciences, biological sciences, the creative arts, um, and, and other kinds of entities that are, are on campus. So we looked at, at the charge letter, and we really were given three goals in our charge letter, and that was to um, identify effective ways to assist faculty in translating traditional scholarly, professional, or creative work into other kinds of products for other audiences, um, to identify potential mechanisms that would assist faculty in increasing the dissemination of communications about their work to outside audiences, not in internal audiences, but sort of outside, potentially non-traditional audiences beyond our, our disciplinary colleagues, and really um, come up with a set of suggestions that would sort of deepen academic cultures within units um, and encourage them to have conversations about the impact of their members, um, their departmental members' um, impact of their research. So. Um, I don't know if you've ever participated on a, on, on a task force, but trying to get a group of 20 academics to agree on a definition, that can take an entire semester. So as chair, uh, working with Phyllis Perez, we really took the approach of working on a more inclusive set of definitions where the way we were defining high impact, because one of the major misperceptions in the first couple of meetings was, is this committee's charge to tell faculty what they should be studying? And if you get nothing else out of this talk today, that was not our charge. The charge was not to tell people what they should be studying because here's an approved list of high impact um, topics. And I know the sound bite's already being created that I said that. Um, no, the, the, the charge of the group was really to help people think through um, strategic communication plans, dissemination strategies, and really become aware of what resources are available on campus to do this right in the here and now. So we, you know, we, dis we defined, once we got over that hurdle, we defined high impact scholarship as really having positive impacts on society, uh, generating new knowledge. Um, we emphasize the transmission of knowledge since we are a teaching institution uh, in large part. I mean, that is part of what we do. But we also focused on um, 
assisting people to increase the potential influence that their work has and to uh, increase the likelihood that they're going to get positive recognition by peers and enhance the national reputation of the institution. So in, in those three goals, we really had um, two things that, two organizational structures that we want to include in the, in the final report. And one is to, one goal for us, um, or for me as a chair, is to say, can we, you know, let's identify, improve, and increase awareness on campus of organizational resources and incentives for high impact research while thinking through ways to reduce barriers um, so that we can um, be more likely to promote a culture of high impact research at the university. And our second sort of organizational, or our second section of the final report will really be the identification and dissemination of specific strategies to faculty that help them to enhance the, the impact of their research at different phases of its development. So I'm gonna walk you through some of our discussions now sort of under those two headings. Okay, so one of the first things that came up was why would people want to do this? And several faculty members from COGOD brought up the concept of incentives over and over and over and over. You know, why would we want to do this? So um, it was really, it was a very good conversation. It's always good to have business folks on the committee, very practical. Um, uh, and it's, it's always interesting to chair an interdisciplinary committee where people are speaking distinctly different languages and you have to kind of parse what is a language difference and where are the similar similarities of ideas? Turns out there are a lot of similarity of ideas, so many sections were easy for me to draft, which was great. Um, but uh, in terms of incentives, two themes really emerged, and one is formalizing recognition on campus for high impact research, saying, cl clearly articulating that it has a value and that being a public intellectual is something that we encourage faculty to do above and beyond citation counts in A-list journals that we really do want to have people engaging in activities that consume a significant amount of time, but we want them to participate in those activities that um, broaden the, the influence of their work into um, non-academic settings. So some of what we talked about was working with the Faculty Senate to rewrite a section of the faculty manual um, that would explicitly include that recognition. Um, we talked about um, uh, urging academic units to uh, rethink or um, supplement their uh, descriptions of the tenure and promotion process or what the criteria are for tenure and promotion to include this role of public intellectual. Um, and then also um, broadening the uh, the criteria for research awards um, and other kinds of tangible rewards that faculty would want to include this role. We also talked about providing uh, supports and both supports in terms of the physical environment that in which one needs the time to do these activities and what are concrete strategies that at the discretion of a dean or department chair or, or program director or faculty would have access to but also um, trying to think through what um, resources are needed and what are available in terms of communicating uh, scholarship to the outside world. And not only defining um, what exists currently and is potentially underutilized, but what for a reasonable cost we could include on campus to expand our capacity. So we, talk, we did talk about uh, formalizing recognition and providing supportive resources in terms of incentives and those kinds of things will be uh, clearly summarized in recommendations in terms of um, uh, explicitly including this public intellectual role in um, tenure and promotion discussions but also in terms of the, the awards that people get or their eligibility for awards. Um, one of the, th the second thing that we wanted to do uh, was really to do an environmental scan of campus and talk about what existing um, resources are there. So these really fall into four categories and, and one is the opportunities or the resources that exist to enhance the working conditions in which a faculty member works and a lot of that has to do with how can you free up time to do these non-traditional activities. And we came up with a list of suggestions that are 
exist now, but the um, the mechanisms or the decision making for allocating them uh, may not be completely transparent. So um, it's an opportunity to say, you know, if you are engaging in this activity, you could be freed up by getting a research assistant or teaching assistant to lighten your load for other things, other parts of your assignment. We also uh, spend a good deal of time um, documenting central, centralized and in-unit staff that are employed by the institution, either centrally or within academic units, to assist faculty to publicize their scholarly activities, as well as um, sort of the gap between the staffing level and the actual need that exists. And, and in doing that, um, part of our report tries to emphasize things that, you know, those faculty who don't get access to a central or unit level resource person to help advertise their work, what other things can we do for them? Um, we came up with a list of uh, existing strategies and mechanisms to improve dissemination of the scholarly work. What exists now? So for in my case, um, I use ResearchGate uh, pretty extensively. It's a scientific uh, social media thingamajig, but it, you know, it sends people your, your recent publications and you can see that they're looking at them and you actually see who's citing things. It pops up, it's very, very useful. Much better than thumbing through the social science citation index. So now I'm definitely dating myself. Um, but also um, looking across campus and seeing what, what uh, resources are there to assist faculty in um, collecting and tracking their scholarly works like ORCID numbers and institutional repository and what kinds of things could we possibly do. So a section of the report documents what is um, currently there and what people could use. Um, and some of this is really for people who are pretty savvy already with technology and they just want to know where the resources are so they can use them. Um, I have to thank my colleague Stefan Kramer from the library and Fernando Benedon from Arts and Sciences for putting together a, a, a wonderful section of the report that talks about recommendations for additional resources. So now we're moving from what we have to what we would like to have. and so. Um, not only did they document some existing resources, but really started to think through um, what could we institutionally put together in a centralized way, whether that's a, um, an, a, a dedicated web page that collects all faculty publications and makes them available, um, to providing supports that would help people um, attach ORCID numbers to their, uh, their publications, or other forms of DOIs, um, what sorts of services and supports could we offer that would sort of automate um, these aggregate these um, scholarly work aggregation systems so that people didn't have to, faculty members didn't have to take time away to upload different kinds of um, articles or creative works that these could be archived in a way that would speed up uh, dissemination of them to interested parties. We did also spend a, a good time, a good bit of time talking about um, ways in which we could modernize um, and streamline um, web page construction, and um, you know do things so people didn't, you know, the page doesn't get refreshed and you lose everything. I see those emails when they fly around the university, um, but we spent a lot of time talking about for a, a, a modest set of um, resources, how could we automate or provide services to um, link faculty into um, aggregation systems that most universities already have but don't currently exist here. So the final report will um, have sort of a wish list and we will be making a recommendation to the provost um, in time for the next budget cycle. Uh, for things that, that we think are reasonable and that faculty would use. Uh, our next, you know, we spent a good bit of time talking about an issue um, about the appropriate balance of uh, roles and responsibilities between centralized um, uh, marketing and um, research communications and folks who function uh, as um, uh, web content developers and communication specialists at the um, at the unit level, and 
um, not unlike a meeting I just left on that, uh, on that uh, exact topic, our committee wasn't able to come up with any specific um, solution to um, ambiguities about uh, how roles and responsibilities at different levels fit together, um, the gaps in capacity between um, the need for this kind of assistance and what current resources support. We weren't able to, to do that, but I think we came up with a list of suggestions um, or, or, or even sort of, um, we weren't able to come up with um, necessarily a solution for, for example, moving beyond tactics for communication to helping deans and um, centralized marketing and communications think through how to maximize their strategic alignment so, um, so that marketing and communications, whether it's done centrally or locally, is really expressing what an academic unit sees itself doing and what its value is. So we, we weren't able to come up with any pat answers and I'm not sure you would expect that in a, a group of 20 faculty, including myself. Um, but we did come up with a, with a number of suggestions that I think will be useful for framing the discussion. So for example, um, it emerged that there's a lot of confusion among faculty about who is supposed to do what. Who is supposed to help me at the unit level and the central level and what is everyone supposed to do? So um, I think a recommendation that's gonna come out is there's a real need for clarity uh, and, and a clear understanding of what different people do um, there's a need for transparency and a written description about what people in central and within academic units, because uh, these communication professionals exist in every academic unit, what are they specifically supposed to do to faculty and how do you access their services? I think one thing that faculty are particularly sensitive about is some people get prioritized for these wonderful media treatments where, for example, a book that's coming out gets a, gets a wonderful press campaign, it leads to an op-ed, it leads to a, a nationally distributed book review, and it really has an impact on the faculty member's career. Some faculty members don't get that treatment and they're left saying, well, what about me? What am I? Chop liver? Why, why don't I get this, this kind of tr this treatment? So I think there, a, th a recommendation is going to come out is there really needs to be transparency in the prioritization of specific faculty members' research agendas and how they get access to those centralized resources. A, a parallel issue is, well, for those who don't get the centralized resources in this, this um, marquee treatment, what can we do for them to um, facilitate the dissemination of their research because we can do something for everybody what is an acceptable level of services and one suggestion that I, I would give having just had my operations go through an external evaluation is whatever structure is agreed upon between central and local in terms of um, research communications it should be regularly evaluated by a disinterested external party that's what I would recommend we'll see where that goes um, so Finally, one of the things that we talked about at the unit level, departmental level, academic unit level, was sort of um, a series. We wanted to collect an, uh, a series of um, low profile events that go on routinely in academic units that um, contribute to the intellectual lifeblood of the department and assist people in um, thinking through how to increase the impact in, of their research. And we came up with this huge list of things that are done, typically at fairly low cost. Um, they're done in specific units. We don't know whether they generalize to other places. So rather than giving recommendations, what we're going to do is, is construct a list of these that make them publicly available. So other people think about things like book launch events, uh, research roundtables, monthly faculty research seminars, celebrations of college research. I guess you, you can probably not guess where that occurs. Um, monthly newsletters that most of the, um, do, the academic units are, are putting together. But other things like book incubators, um, uh, academic units purchasing books and distributing them to thought leaders, um, faculty filmed faculty spotlights that are put up on web pages. Um, different kinds of things that are um, not terribly expensive to do, but can be really entree to getting um, some of our faculty to think through how they want to publicize their works. 
Uh, we also have um, a number of internal funding mechanisms for people to take ideas, begin to collect data, and move their ideas to the next level. So we have been able to identify a number of things that seem to be working within units. We wanted to collect those and see if we can encourage more units to begin those things, those kinds of activities, and really deepen the conversation about um, how to increase impact of faculty research within the unit. I think when we move into the second half of the final report, my comments get much shorter. I know, thank God. Um, because w our conclusions have to be more tentative. For example, one of the first things that we wanted to talk about was if once we identify best practices that are out there, things that really seem to work at different universities, what's the best way of informing faculty about that? We came up with some very old school suggestions. As the average age on the group was probably over 50. Um, but we talked about training workshops and web-based um, archives, web-based resources. But this is where a, a series of uh, town halls or also a conversation at the upcoming faculty retreat will be helpful because I think we'd really like to know what are people in this room or other rooms going to find particularly useful? What, how are you going to be able to get this information? What's a way we could maximize your, um, your ability to access this information? We also um, wanted to come up with um, sort of standard guidance or best practices, if you will, um, or different examples of strategies um, that work in the early stages of project development. Most of what we talked about, a lot of what we talked about was what do people do once a research product is fully formed? What we want to assist people to who want to do this is having them think through what's a strategic communication plan that I, I start to develop before I collect any data? How do I think through um, and, and cultivate media contacts um, before you know, while I'm doing the project, not once the project's done and I'm, I'm moving rapidly on to the next project. So, you know, what we'll do there is provide a list of resources um, from a well, you know, that, that have been well received in other places. I think one of the things that we've, we've had a lot of luck doing is identifying compelling case studies of, of high impact, um, uh, high impact uh, events and strategies that are currently being implemented. And many of these are, are drawn from specific research centers on, the, on campus, like the Center for Latin American Latino Studies, um, which has, you know, sponsors conferences, actually takes paid advertisements to advertise its um, members' research, has its own website, extensively uses uh, social media, has podcasts that they do and a very active blog, um, as well as other um, centers on campus like the Center for Health Risk and Society, the Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies. We've looked at and cataloged a number of very high impact and sometimes expensive infrastructural um, and um, interactive media um, strategies that they use to uh, publicize members' research. So one of the things that we want to do is not recommend strategies because what works for different groups is going to be different, but to highlight the effectiveness of particular examples as a way of potentially suggesting that other people might want to look at these, at, at these strategies. In addition, I think the law school um, uh, and SIS have a number of projects where they not only um, have been very effective at um, taking the research that faculty are doing and, re and translating that into policy recommendations and getting that information out to, uh, to thought leaders. Um, but they have also done things like um, uh, either have internal funding or external funding to train faculty to work effectively with the media, to um, have them go into settings where they're working with policymakers to understand what policymakers want and to become more effective at moving from academic settings to, um, 
uh, to policy settings. Jim Goldgeier's um, funded project uh, by Carnegie on bridging the gap is a good example. So we'll be providing examples like that of, of groups on campus that have been thus far very successful at um, navigating between what goes on on campus and external decision-making audiences, which really kind of, that activity really exemplifies what we're talking about. Um, what, that's one example of how one increases the uh, research impact or the impact of, of uh, the types of research that we specialize in here at, at, at AU. I think just in closing, I wanna say that one of the things that we, we discussed was, well, are there any negative consequences of participating um, bring, uh, uh, in um, activities to increase one's research impact? I mean, taking on this public intellectual role. And, and many of the faculty on the committee um, expressed concerns that if if faculty members get too involved in this, these types of activities too early in their career, it may have a detrimental impact on tenure and promotion um, uh, actions. And so, um, you know, that's one thing that we, we are going to highlight in the report, but we also are, are um, in discussions made aware of um, a series of, of conversations that are going on in SOC where um, unit-wide, there are discussions in the different programs there about what are the expectable, what are, what are appropriate expectations for faculty members at different stages of their careers for the impact of their research and how would you assess that? So that's a good example of an academic unit on campus which is having, uh, tackling these issues very proactively and setting expectations and really trying to deepen their academic culture and we're including that as an example that others may want to follow. So um, just to give you an idea of where we are, I think our timeline for moving forward is to uh, wrap up the, the draft of the final report, maybe this weekend, um, depending on how fast I type. Um, but certainly in the next week or so, we'd have a full draft of the final report. I think then we're going to, leading up to the um, faculty retreat, have a series of conversations within academic units and try and solicit uh, faculty input about um, how broad and inclusive our examples are, um, whether there are other ways of thinking about strategies that would be um, effective for certain, um, appropriate for certain disciplines or that people would like to see included in mentioning. Um, I think there, there'll be sort of a comment period generally. We'll roll out the full report at the faculty retreat and then probably, I don't know, set up a working group depending on um, whether people allocate resources or not to start taking some of the recommendations and, and, and implementing them. But a lot of good conversations with a lot of very bright people from di different disciplines. I'm looking forward to seeing some of these recommendations be put into place to assist the faculty of the institution um, better communicate their research and affect the, um, the audiences that they want to affect. So that's kind of where we are now and, and we'll see where we go from here. But I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about the process or what we're doing on the, on the project. Um, uh, I know that, um, I was asked to repeat it with the microphone, excuse me. Was there any discussion about providing media training for faculty members who wish to do interviews with the media? In a discussion that I was in just before I raced over here, um, I know there's one academic unit on campus that is working with all its incoming faculty and younger faculty to train them to work with the media. My understanding is that there's no there is no opposition centrally to finding the resources to provide that kind of training for faculty who want it. I haven't heard anyone say they think that would be a bad idea. Can you speak to some of the concerns that were raised regarding um, being involved, particularly if you're young in your career? You mentioned that there was concern that it could be detrimental, detrimental to young scholars if they're involved in media. Could you speak to some of the concerns that were raised? Well, the concerns regards? were different in different units. So like if you have a unit that is very focused on concrete criteria for 
tenure and promotion. So, you know, it's got to be a citation in this specific list of journals. That kind of um, public intellectual activity, going and talking to media outlets about the um, the um, the uh, concrete implications of your research may not be particularly well valued, and people will say explicitly to you, you should be doing this prescribed set of activities if you want to get promoted or tenured here. Um, I mean, I'm a developmental psychologist. I have funding from NIH. They're constantly asking us, what are the prevention, intervention imp implications of the research that you do with multi-problem youth? And so for someone in my area, it's, it's sort of natural that you kind of think about those, those kinds of things. I, I think the concern was expressed generally that if you're in a unit that doesn't value these kinds of activities, then you need to have an explicit conversation about how those will be evaluated in annual, annual evaluations or tenure and promotion actions. This is a very sensitive topic right now. We have had a number of applications for tenure that have been turned down in the last year or so um, because, well, because, well, <laughs> there have been questions about potentially the, um, the impact of the research. So does the research have impact if it's published but nobody cites it? Does the research that you're doing have impact if, if it doesn't necessarily influence anybody? And I understand that you know, when you're going from assistant to associate, that's a very short time window to, to have impact in your field. But um, there are costs for, for not having your research not having, your research or creative activities not having impact. But if you go too far in the other direction, there may also be costs. So we talked a lot about trying to find the appropriate balance, but that balance has to be articulated within the academic unit. And there are academic units having those explicit conversations. We'd like to encourage all of them to. I have a question. <laughs> um, if you could pick three of, well, it's a magic wand question. If you could make three of the recommendations that you anticipate coming out of the report perk to the top and get President Kerwin really excited about them, what would those three recommendations be? Um, well, I think uh, this, this sounds like a comprehensive exam question. <laughs> I got a question like this when I defended my dissertation. Um, I'm, I'm having PTSD moment here. Um, well, I think rather than reinvent the wheel, um, the recommendations I would like to see, I, I, I'm not a fan of over duplication of services at multiple levels within an organization, although there seems to be a fetish for that at AU. Um, what, what I would say is that it would be great, what, one recommendation I would like to push forward is if we have underutilized services here that are effective, what can we do to get people to use them? And I think um, uh, Stefan Kramer in the library has been um, diligent about identifying resources that people in the library, that people wouldn't necessarily think are, are even relevant to what they do. Um, I, I would like to see more of an emphasis on intentionality and getting people to think about their, their research and their creative activities in a much more strategic way. And I, I'm not sure how to do that, but my colleagues have some concrete um, examples. I think also, um, and this might sound, this is sort of an icky concept in some academic environments, but I think we have to be explicit about prioritizing what we want to push forward and identifying areas of excellence and marketing them because that is what in many ways brings in and attracts both undergraduate and graduate students and that's what attracts um, our next cohort, our next generation of faculty of the institution. And um, many universities try to be good at everything. Um, I, um, you know, we're, we don't have, we're not a huge land grant institution, so what are, we, what are we choosing to push forward? And you know, that may be tied to AU 2030, it may be tied to other 
kinds of research initiatives, but I, I, I'm not convinced we do the best job possible in marketing some of the excellent work that our faculty are doing, and I'd like to see um, a, a more holistic approach to doing that. I have a question. Um, back here. Um, so at my last university, we had a public relations office which facilitated press releases. So when you publish new research, you could contact them and then they would do a press release for you. Do we have anything like that here? Absolutely, but that question exemplifies one of the problems on campus. Faculty don't necessarily know what's available. We have a centralized marketing and communications operation called UCM, University Marketing and Communications. They placed, I think in the last year, 800 media placements. They do a fantastic job at placing um, uh, announcements about what faculty are doing. If you go to the research page on the AU website, you'll see some of the products that they've produced. And some of them have been phenomenally um, effective at moving somebody's project from not being very well recognized to getting a national platform. Um, but we also have things that are done within the academic units, you know, development of web content, um, uh, sort of grooming faculty to work with the media, grooming faculty in terms of a story that's coming down the road six months from now, setting up a pipeline of stories. And then there are, are very concrete services that are offered either within academic units or service operations like the library that anybody can use. You know, setting up a, a profile on ResearchGate, you know, to get your research out there to people that you've, you've already linked to. Um, but there's, we do have centralized marketing, we have unit level staff, and we have a lot of resources that people don't know about because they're not sort of collected on one place where if you have a question, you know, there's an FAQ about like, how do I get my book noticed or how do I get this exhibit that I'm doing or this recital, how do I get this out there? Um, there's no one place to go to find out what's available to assist you in alerting the, the audience that you wanna target to what you're doing. Let me chime in with a perception, um, having been on the faculty some number of years, about how I think a number of the faculty members see themselves vis-a-vis -vis the media. All you have to do is look at our buses and see every how many seconds is one of us out there on the news. But often that's in response to somebody from USA Today, somebody from Associated Press, somebody from KQED, or whatever it happens to be, somebody saying, hey, do you have a good resource here on campus? And the university for many years has done a superb job, better than most universities, in getting us to be experts out there in the field. What we haven't over the years done as good a job at, and we haven't given faculty a mindset for, is saying, here are the things we are creating. Here's what our research is about. And now can you help us get the word about what we care about, mm -hmm. not what they're doing a story on, but what we care about. How can we get that into the news? And I know this transition is happening and mm -hmm. there's some wonderful things that are taking place. But one of the transitions, I think, has to be in the minds of the faculty themselves about what their role is in switching who's in the driver's seat. Exactly. I think that's a wonderful observation. I mean, it's your intellectual property. Who do you want to have consume it? I mean, it's just like in graduate admissions. Do we want to, on a yearly basis, just see who applies and pick the best ones by sitting around with a bunch of paper files around a table? Or do we want to go out and recruit people? Um, I think the, um, uh, the, the Lichtman Brightman book on FDR and the Jews is a great example. They worked with a publicist and very, in a relentless marketing campaign to get that book into the New York Times uh, book review. And they were successful and it's led to awards. But they were very strategic about how they did that. Now, that cost a lot of money to do and not everyone can do that. But there are many things that we can do rather than say, well, I published the article, hopefully somebody will read it. There, there are a lot of things that you can do um, in a very proactive but low, low cost way to market your intellectual property and make sure people see it. But at this point, uh, what I'd like to do is have all of us 
thank John Tubman, John Tubman, the one we knew and the one we have now come to know, um, for uh, giving us, I think this is the first public sneak, pre yep, a sneak peek on what's happening with this high impact research. Yeah, and I think we'll be trying to not have this be a report that dies a dusty death on a bookshelf somewhere. But then, you know, we, we take components of it and move it to the web and um, try to work with operations like CTRL to say how can we um, work together to have a training session? How can we work with other units to do media training for faculty? Um, I don't want to be in charge of it, but I'm, I'm happy to facilitate it and because I really think there's there's a lot of room for growth at AU. People are doing some really fantastic research and creative activities. We, we want to make sure that, the, that nationally that story is being represented fully. Well, thank you very, very much. But before you go, you may notice on your tables there's a lot of paper. And we are a green campus. And we are a green CTRL. And we have a green teaching program. But we figured, as you were sitting here, you probably at least eyed some of the different colors, if nothing else. Let me just tell you really quickly what you've got there. You're welcome to take them. If you don't take them today, we're going to recycle them for lunch tomorrow and then for next week, so not to worry. Uh, there's a handout on the workshops that the research support group gives. There's a handout on the t technology in the classroom workshops that teaching learning resources, again, all within CTRL gives. There's a handout on online learning and the new course that's coming up this fall. Uh, Jim has left. Laura, you're sitting here? Yes, that Laura and Jim are going to be teaching uh, for online and hybrid classes. There's a handout on the green teaching program. The queen of green teaching is standing to my left. Um, there's a handout on mobile learning. Last year at this time, we launched a big mobile learning initiative, and there were opportunities for people to apply for grants to do something new and wonderful with online learning. There is a new opportunity this year. To my right is Lucas Regner, who is running the uh, faculty technology initiative side of the house in CTRL, which is in charge of the mobile learning grants. We encourage you to have some conversation with him, see what might be interesting. Every year, as you know, we give a teaching with research award and a scholarship of teaching and learning award, and that is tomorrow that we have the speakers, or is that next week? Both. Both. Okay, we will have one speaker from Teaching with Research and one speaker with Teaching, a uh, so scholarship of Teaching and Learning. Stay tuned, you can find out. So come to two more lunches, and you'll see the winners from last year. And then there's a brand new initiative that says Open American. I I'll get to that. That's not brand new, but it is an initiative. There's a brand new initiative called Open American, which is an attempt on the part of CTRL working with the University Library and the Office of Campus Life to come to grips with the fact that course materials, particularly textbooks, particularly introductory textbooks, are getting incredibly expensive. And what are the kinds of resources we can draw upon or maybe create ourselves that will lower the price but up the amount of learning that goes on? So there's a flyer that describes the new program. Um, Lucas, once again, is the person to get in touch with. We're going to be launching this initiative at the uh, faculty retreat and in various other contexts as well. But if you have ideas, funnel them his way. Anna, did I miss you? If I, okay, but, but Marilyn has a flyer that we didn't get out onto the tables, but it is uh, our second year of the Ann Farron Curriculum Design Award, which is uh, generously made uh, possible by, yes, Ann Farron after whom the Ann Farron Conference is named. Uh, and it is for looking at how you take the principles of general education and incorporate them into the curriculum in the major. So we had one team winning it last year from environmental science, and the competition is on. So we very much look forward to yours and those of your colleagues' uh, applications. And now. I have my own mic. You have Thank your you. Own. Um, all of you were given a small evaluation form when you entered the room, so if you have a minute or two, uh, feel free to fill it out and drop it off in the box by the exit. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. We look forward to you enjoying the rest of the sessions today, all day tomorrow, and then again next week. And I hope to see you for lunch as well.